acre conserved land parcel um, that includes all this other land around it in color zoned by other agencies or conserved by other agencies. And this blue line right here is the watershed of Cowbell Brook, which um, is where this study takes place. And as you can see, almost all of it is contained on uh, TNC property, about 70% of it. And the rest, almost the whole 3,300 acre watershed is conserved. Um, it's about 3.5 miles of stream that flows into the Lamoille. It's mostly bedrock control, but has evidence of incision at places. Um, and this picture, you can see some bedrock here, and then uh, it's kind of hard to tell in the projection, but there's some uh, eroding banks up there. Um, the land use on the site was heavily logged, and a lot of the wood has been removed from the natural system. And when we purchased the property, we put a forever wild easement on it. And that just means that no harvest would take place there. And so all these things are really important because they combine together to tell a story of why we chose to restore the site and why we chose wood additions to be there. And so uh, I'm going to quickly go over some channel geomorphology for people who may not know. Um, these cross sections aren't from this property, but I think they show the extremes really well. So the top is what we call an incised river. It's narrow and deep. Um, and if you imagine during high flood events, it water would just pour through it, and we call that disconnected from the floodplain because it wouldn't be able to overtop the banks, uh, as opposed to the bottom, which is shallower and wider, and during those high flows, we'd be able to overtop. And so what we're trying to do here is go from a disconnected floodplain to a connected floodplain at Calvo Brook. And wood structures are, are known to be really uh, helpful in that, and they're, they back up sediment and grade the bed um, to reconnect the channel to its floodplain. Um, and in doing so, they're creating a lot of habitat for aquatic organisms, and that's really well documented in literature. Um, and as we're raising the bed up, we're also creating climate resiliency because we're creating healthy, functioning floodplains that are retaining that water and retaining the sediments that normally would have rushed downstream and uh, taken out infrastructure and polluted our waterways. And so why did we choose this site to do it? Um, well, it's a pretty low-risk site. We don't have a lot of neighbors. There's not a lot of infrastructure to take out if these were to potentially fail. Um, and the removal of wood from the system is really unique because um, normally we would let nature govern and, and guide itself, but in this system, it would take it would have taken 40 to 50 years for that wood to regenerate and then be able to recruit back into the stream. So to keep up with the pace of climate change and to meet our management objectives for the site, we want to be able to accelerate that restoration and add the wood to the system. So in order to do this, we went through a design process. There was a desktop analysis, including radar and risk assessments, and then we ground truth it in a field assessment, um, looking at the slope and width of the channel, the substrate composition, and most importantly, assessing where the trees were that we could fell, um, and then a whole permitting process. And when it came time for implementation, we hired a Sawyer crew, um, and within the desktop analysis, they picked the specific site that they chose based on avoiding ledge areas, um, putting in places where the slope was no more than 4%, which is just an industry guideline, and finding the right trees to drop in the right place. So they had to be wide enough, and the, the goal is about 1.5, um, the step had to be 1.5 the length of the bankful width of that spot. So in full disclosure, I did not work at the Nature Conservancy when all of that happened, the design and the implementation process. So um, my presentation and like what my focus is on is on monitoring, um, and so, the project was implemented in the spring of 2018, that's when the structures went in. They were monitored in the fall of 2018, and then again this fall in 2019. And so what we were looking for when we were monitoring was four different types of data. We were looking for photo points at all 50 structures, looking at the, taking pictures of the structure from the upstream, downstream, river right, river left. Uh, we also recorded information about every structure, whether it was intact or not, if it was impounding water, um, if there are any new recruits on the structure and how big those were. And then we also looked at geomorphic data, um, mostly through cross sections. So we monumented rebar in the banks on either side and strung a tape across, and that's what I'm doing here, taking distance from the tape to get those cross sections. But that's only showing kind of a snapshot of what's really there. The coolest bed features could be two feet away, you're not picking that up in a cross section. So we also did sketches, just uh, hand-drawn sketches, of, from an aerial perspective of what's happening at those 10 structures. And so these were the numbers that jumped out at me when I went through the monitoring stats and I want to share with you. So there were beaver present on, in the natural area and we found sign of them at two of the structures, which is exciting. Um, only six of the 50 have failed. Eight are showing signs of impounding water. 29 have notable sediment accumulation, which is over half. And 
41 new stems were accumulated on structures, whether that was from the six failing and being caught from the downstream structures or natural recruits. And so an example of that, that you can see in the picture, picture on the left is 2018, just as this condition, fall, and then the fall of 2019, you have this big yellow birch that's kind of hard to see in this presentation. Um, and then this is from the river right, and you can see this new recruit on there. And so structure two, which is where this is, is one of our most downstream structures, and it, it caught this, um, this yellow birch that came from a failed structure upstream. So this is structure 20. Um, uh, what these what structures are known to do and kind of what their selling point is, is uh, creating habitat for aquatic organisms, especially fish. Fisheries biologists are really excited about it. Um, and so this is in 2018 in the spring before the structure went in. And then this was the fall of 2018. And you can see this branch um, from the structure is creating two different flow patterns. You kind of have a high, during this high flow event, you have a high velocity here and lower. And so the structure is really creating a pocket that aquatic organisms can get away from that high flow. Um, and that's what they're known to do. They're known to create a diversity of different habitats. So whatever the aquatic organism needs, uh, that's, it has a place to go. And so deep uh, pools are known to be really helpful for cold water fish. Um, and so here's Shane uh, in, up to his waist in this pool that was created from the structure. This is also structure 20 looking from the upstream side. Um, and we were really excited that we could do that and create habitat and create that structural diversity for them. But even more exciting was the fact that um, we could use this, uh, this site as a model to show the geomorphic response of these streams as, as a long-term monitoring project. So it's kind of hard to tell in this picture, but the, um, at Structure 20, this was in 2019 when we monitored, the, um, it actually graded a lot of sediments there. And these are the cross sections from that. And you can kind of see this like extreme thalweg here. Sorry, I'm like shaking. There's like thalweg here. Um, <laughs> and then it like uh, narrowed out a little bit here. And it's hard to tell from these cross sections, but we actually got about a half a foot of sediment accumulation there, um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you think in terms of cubic feet, that's pretty cool after just a year and a half of these structures being in. And so this is what the sediment looks like. Um, this is. Uh, if you couldn't tell by now, in the 2018 photos, they're it's during high flow, so a lot of them aren't super comparable. But um, in 2019, we're getting all this fine sediment that's accumulating on the banks and on the structure. And so we're not getting that bed load that we need to, to grade the bed, but it's a start. And it's really exciting to see that starting after just a year and a half. So this is structure 28. The top is 2018 and the bottom is 2019. And again, it's hard to, it's high flow, so you can't really see it. But there's a lot of deposition here. And then there's um, the sediment, fine sediment being caught on the structure itself. And plants are growing out of it, which is a kind of exciting. It's starting to create some, some structural integrity with the root system there. Uh, and I like this example a lot. Uh, we, so both these are from spring of 2018. And we drop a structure here to maintain this pool for habitat, but also to maintain this gravel bar here. And gravel bars are really exciting to see because not only are they a roughness tool for rivers, meaning that when the water hits it, it helps slow down the river, but it's also helping eventually reconnect that floodplain to the channel. So we have this gravel bar, and what we're doing is enhancing the deposition on that bar <coughs> through these structures. And so under high flow in 2018, but you can't see this size kind of size. But um, you have the gravel bar here, and there's some fine sediment that has deposited on there, which is really exciting. And so for those of you who don't know, this is a channel evolution model. Real brief, there's a stable condition where the floodplain is connected, and naturally what happens is that river will incise, widen, and then in order to get back to a stable condition, it needs to activate those sediments and build back up. And so this model's a little outdated, I think, because we're starting to think of it as more of a cyclical process that we can get back to this original position. Um, but I think it was simple enough to kind of show what I'm talking about here. And so here we have another gravel bar that's kind of hard to see in 2018. And then in 2019, we have plants growing on it. It's still independent of the bank a little bit, but the hope is that through deposition, we're gonna help reconnect the channel to that floodplain. Um, and then maybe even this becomes floodplain when all the plants start to grow on it. And then here again, um, it's underwater here, but then you have this gravel bar and there's some fine sediment on there and just like this small lush forest of vegetation that is still disconnected a little bit, but is on its way. 
And so that was kind of the message of all of this and looking at these pictures is we didn't get super like extreme data, like numbers to pull out of this because it's only been a year and a half and this is, geomorphic response takes years and years. So it was more exciting to us to be able to show these pictures and be able to say, hey, there has been change after just a year and a half, it's just not number of data. And I think that's almost more valuable. Um, so as we were reviewing our monitoring, just some things that stuck out. The biggest thing is just an overarching theme in the river community is that's hard to nail down what parameters to study and what methods to use to get those and to find the geomorphic response. So like I said before, cross sections were only a snapshot and then the sketches are man-made so they are time consuming and there's a little room for error and um, and it's difficult for the human eye to see that change year to year, so maybe making those less frequent. Um, and then also the photos are really hard to keep consistent just because you take the photo um, the first year and then step back and the tree falls exactly where you were standing. Um, so now that, that before condition isn't well documented, it's hard to have that comparable to later, which is unfortunate, but um, now that we've done it a couple rep repetitions, we've started to understand where the best places to take the photo are um, for continuity. And then the other thing is more baseline data. We've recorded a lot, but obviously there's always more to record. Um, and so if we had recorded impoundment data, it would be really interesting to compare that to now. Um, and if we had looked at the substrate composition, it would be really interesting as well. But we might move forward um, and do that in the future, but we'll never have that before condition, which um, is unfortunate, but kind of the reality of monitoring, I guess. So long term, we'd really like to see the cross-section area of our tent structures decrease, because that means it's not just accumulating sediment, it's also getting that bed load and abrading the bed. Um, we'd also like to see more diverse bed features included, so just continue to build the pools and the ripples and scours, um, and with that, more diverse substrate matter, and like I said, potentially monitoring that in the future. And what would be really ideal is if the beavers came in and colonized one of four more of our structures and just really changed that landscape in a way that we never could have imagined. It would be really cool. And so why do these wood structures matter? Why has the Nature Conservancy spent so much time and allocated so many resources for this? And it really all comes down to climate change adaptation and resiliency. So we wanted, we took this site and we accelerated the restoration there so it could keep up with climate change. And in doing so, created habitat for lots of different species. And hopefully this river can serve as a um, climate refugia for um, those aquatic organisms within the larger watershed. So if they're in a degrading stream right now, an incising stream, they can come here and use it as a getaway from the unpredictability of associated with climate change. Um, and by abrading the bed and connecting it to the floodplain, we're making those floodplains healthier. And in doing so, creating a climate resiliency where they're retaining water that would have washed downstream and taken out infrastructure. Um, so a climate resiliency for us. And um, also, the, they're retaining sediments and nutrients that would have polluted the Lamoille and eventually Lake Champlain. So not only is this project um, helping nature, but it's really helping people as well. And so we're really looking forward to just continuing to monitor the site and be able to use it as a model um, to bring to groups like this and share how the wood structures are helping change the stream geomorphically. Thank you. Yeah, one of the, uh, I think, purposes of woody debris addition is when you have streams that may have like this very broad, shallow flows, that in some places it'll create higher velocity more chance and actually create some deeper pools that mm -hmm. we noticed and documented that happening. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the slide that I showed with the um, gravel <laughs> bar that we maintain, um, that pool definitely, because it's channeling all the velocity through that area, it's scouring and creating that pool. And that's just a classic example of habitat that's being created by the wood structures. So yeah, that's it's really exciting to see the continuation of creating those pools for fish. Yes? Uh, two questions. Do sure. you have a target sort of number of structures per linear mile? That would be one question. And then second of all, those structures were placed, it looks like, uh, predominantly the pool water. Did you place structures to promote lateral erosion? Any, uh, 
places. Yeah, so again, I didn't, I wasn't there for the uh -huh. design, but I, I do know that there was a target. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but I can uh -huh. refer you to Shane after. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, the ones I showed were just examples that were showing holding water. And so there were definitely a lot of examples that were strategically placed to help um, create some lateral diversity um, and maintain different bank features and bed features. So yeah, that was included in there. I, I do have more pictures if you're interested. <laughs> we can show later or email or whatever. But yeah. yeah. This sounds like a wonderful project for a long-term biomonitoring project for fish and invertebrates. And I wonder, is that a component or have you thought about that uh, to incorporate for uh, such an investigation? Yeah, I, I, it's not a component right now, mm. but um, I know that we worked a lot with Fish and Wildlife when we were considering this, so I'm not sure if there's something in the works for that. I'm trying to find Shane. I think yeah, <laughs> So, Jim, that's a good question, and the guy that's going to be speaking next um, is involved in the study <laughs> on not this particular wood addition project because it just didn't work out, but yeah. Aaron and, and, and Jim are, um, are they yeah, other, other wood addition projects. Yeah, we have done some in the past, but not for a long-term project over many years. And I think that would be uh, in the in the face of climate change. I think that's what would really be beneficial. Yeah, definitely. No, for, there is one going on in the Nalhegan <laughs> Basin with Jeff Drasser that you can, you can read about. That would be great. And yeah. we have done them, them in the Nalhegan, but again, not long-term biomarkers. It will be. Okay. <laughs>